Today, I will be talking about large language models and their applications. Conversational artificial intelligence is the most important human computer interface because we need to be able to solve problems by working with computers. And in order to do that, we need computers that can understand what we say, can um, generate responses that help us, and then can speak them back to us. And uh, there are such enormous potential for these uh, interfaces to change the way that we work. But it's a difficult problem because language is complicated. There's a lot of meaning. There's a lot of different uh, shades of, of um, uh, ideas that come across in language. And uh, in order to have a computer that can understand those and can respond appropriately, uh, we need to have really good models that, uh, that have been trained on enormous amounts of language. And um, recently, over the past few years, there has been a revolution in natural language processing based on large transformer models. And the whole world has found that, that these models are one of the best ways to advance the state of the art in NLP applications. And we've seen a really astonishing rate of growth where uh, the size of these models is increasing by almost an order of magnitude every year. Um, recently, there was the GPT-3 model that came out from OpenAI at 175 billion parameters. Uh, it's enormously compute intensive to train this model, but the uh, applications of these models are really great. So I'm going to talk about a few ways of using these language models uh, to solve problems. And the first is with a uh, left to right language model like GPT-2 or GPT-3. And the way these models work is that you have text and the goal of the model is to predict the next word given the past. So we call that left to right uh, for languages that you know, read from left to right. And uh, so, for example, this task of initially his, he supported himself and his something, we want to predict the next word, is going to be family. And um, these language models are very good at generation. They're very good at uh, learning the structure of language and the meaning of language. And uh, it turns out that when you train one of these very large language models on enormous databases, such as, for example, all of the text that you can find on the internet, these models start learning uh, detailed associations about uh, all of the different things in the world and how they relate to each other. And, um, and then they become very good at generating text that actually makes sense in context. And um, on the right, you can see a, a language model perplexity graph as we increase the size of the model from 355 million parameters, which is the blue line, to 8 billion parameters, which is the yellow line. And um, as we do that, our language models get stronger and stronger um, when we measure them, but then also their results uh, get more and more impressive. And uh, recently, GPT-3 took this to 175 billion parameters, so even much bigger uh, than, than 8 billion parameters, and showed really impressive zero-shot learning. We can also use these models for more discriminative tasks. So BERT, for example, is, is a family of models uh, that is very popular for um, solving discriminative questions that are, you know, asking uh, the model to understand uh, language and then produce results like yes or no questions or entailment or um, solving multiple choice questions about uh, the, the text. And when we train these models, we train them by uh, dropping out some percentage of the word and then having the model reconstruct them. Um, so, for example, uh, if, we, if we have two sentences here, uh, we, we remove 15% of the words, we put them through the model, have the model fill in those missing words. Uh, that's our, that's uh, one of the outputs of the model. And then the other output um, from the BERT model is a sort of a logical um, uh, connection output. Is the, are the two sentences that we are uh, uh, putting through the model connected? Um, and uh, in this case, these two sentences are not connected, and so the answer should be, should be no. Um, so when you train these models uh, with these objectives, they learn a lot about the structure of language and, and how to analyze it. And then you start getting uh, really amazing results on a large number of uh, tasks that we use to measure uh, discriminative language models. Um, so for example, the um, MNLI uh, uh, and QQP uh, tasks. These come from the GLUE benchmark, and they're about 
entailment, like whether uh, text actually is connected to another piece of text and how they're connected. Um, and uh, uh, also squad is a question answering uh, task. We see that we, we get better and better uh, results on these tasks as we increase the size of the model. And then uh, finally, the race benchmark, these are uh, English comprehension benchmarks taken from high school and, and middle school uh, tests from actual English classes. And we can see that uh, these models are starting to get um, really close to human accuracy um, uh, when, they, when the models are trained on enough data and have enough parameters. We can also train these models to uh, generate questions and answers. And this helps us make better question answering system. In this case, we have four different large language models. One is generating text. Um, one is extracting potential answers from the text. One is posing questions from those answers given the text. And then uh, the, the last one is filtering out bad question answer pairs. And it turns out that um, if we train a question answering model using synthetic questions and synthetic answers on synthetic text, we can actually get um, better question answering performance than if we train on just the real text alone. Um, and and that's, kind of, that's kind of amazing in showing the power of these large language models. Um, and the, the last example I wanted to talk about is chatbots. Um, we recently had some work on a model we call generative conversation control. And uh, this model uh, is trained on large amounts of data from Reddit, which is uh, threaded conversations with multiple people. Uh, and so we've trained the model to be able to continue conversations uh, conditioned on the persona of the people that are interacting. Uh, and, and we find that um, the results are, are very close to indistinguishable from uh, human uh, conversations when we, when we show them uh, to people and ask them to rate them. So there's lots of applications for these uh, very large language models, and, and I think we're going to continue to see them increase, um, especially with the zero-shot capabilities of these uh, very, very large language models that, that are starting to become powerful enough to solve new problems just by posing them in natural language and then asking the model uh, to complete the result. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, for the rest of my talk, I'd actually like to discuss how we do this, how we train these models. Um, and we are using a framework called Megatron. It's built on PyTorch. Um, it, uh, it's open source and, and there's a paper that describes how it works and it's been used by, by us at NVIDIA and also by um, people at Microsoft and, and um, the techniques have been used elsewhere such as uh, uh, Facebook's Blender bot. Um, you know, we, when we created this project, we did it because we knew that natural language was really important and people needed to know uh, how to train the, these very large models efficiently on GPUs. And so that's, that's what Megatron's all about. Uh, in order to do this, we use a lot of model parallelism. Uh, there's interlayer parallelism, which is sometimes called pipeline parallelism, where we take different layers of the neural network and split them across multiple devices. Um, so for example, this top picture, the green layers are, are on one device and then the blue layers are on another device. We also have intralayer, or sometimes called tensor parallelism, where the layers individually are split across multiple devices. Um, and and um, you know, we use both of those in Megatron. Why do we uh, use tensor model parallelism, this intralayer model parallelism? Well, it turns out it's uh, simple, simple to implement and it's easy to load balance um, compared with other types of model parallelism. It also has less implications for the batch size because there's no pipeline bubble. Um, and uh, you can use both, right? So you can use both intralayer model parallelism as well as um, pipeline parallelism. Um, because these large transformer models have matrix multiplies that are very, very big, uh, splitting the matrix multiply actually uh, is, is a good idea. Um, and it is possible because we have uh, very high bandwidth interconnects between GPUs inside of, of um, our NVLink connected machines. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what are the challenges with splitting up uh, layers inside uh, of multiple devices? Well, one of the biggest challenges is that as you split the computation, you have lower math intensity. Um, and uh, that means that uh, at some point you become bandwidth bound if you continue to make the model, uh, the, the, the slices of the model on each device smaller. 
Um, in, in terms of the A100 GPU, which has uh, 312 teraflops, but it has uh, 1.5 terabytes per second, the intensity, the arithmetic intensity is about 200. And so when we're splitting the model, we, we keep that in mind and don't split the model small too small, because if, if we were to do that, the uh, arithmetic intensity would be too low and, and we wouldn't see good scaling. Um, so how do we do this kind of splitting? Well, um, if, if you can imagine, uh, there's basically two ways of splitting a matrix, either by the rows or by the columns. Um, and when you do that, uh, you're gonna have different communication that's required between the devices. Um, in some places, you're gonna need to do an all reduce and in other places, you're gonna need to do an all gather application. And they're kind of uh, conjugate for the row, row split and the column split. And it turns out that with transformer models, we can use both of these splits in, and get a, a really good result. Um, and and this, is, this is what we do in Megatron. Um, and again, we're building on PyTorch and using the pre-existing nickel uh, back, back end to do the communication. Um, and we group all of the math heavy operations together before the communication point so that we can scale as efficiently as possible. Um, the transformer is built out of two different building blocks versus the multi-layer perceptron. Um, and uh, then there's the split, there's the attention heads. Um, and, uh, you know, you can choose which way you want to split them, but it turns out that um, if, we, uh, if we split it in, uh, in a particular way, we can reduce communication overheads quite a bit. So this is what um, a, a, a partition multi-level perceptron looks like um, with the communication inserted as the F and G boxes on this slide. Um, for the self-attention, which is a little bit more complex than the multi-level perceptron, uh, we can also do the same trick. Uh, it's just you have to pay attention a little bit to the details, um, and it, it looks like this. Um, and then when we combine them, we have um, you know, both the multi-level perceptron as well as the uh, attention uh, together. And, and if, we, if we do it in the appropriate order, we can re remove communication. Um, and uh, that leads to this result where we are scaling very efficiently on uh, the uh, large GPU clusters. So um, we've been evaluating our work on the DGX A100 Superpod um, and showing that as we go um, from small models on a few GPUs to large models on, on many GPUs, we can uh, still achieve very good scalability. So combining model parallelism as well as uh, standard data parallelism out to 1,024 GPUs, we're getting 73% of our single GPU baseline, um, which, is, which is pretty good. And um, especially given that our single GPU baseline is sustaining uh, 150 teraflops per second on a single A100 GPU, which is half of the theoretical peak. And so, um, so that, that shows that uh, this approach is, is scaling very efficiently. And um, there's a few um, details that I, that I thought were interesting uh, to point out to people that are uh, also working on this, um, is that we found that we needed to change the model structure for BERT models in order to uh, scale it and make it larger. Um, specifically, we had to move the residual connection in order to allow for the direct flow of gradients. Um, in a similar style to how GPT-2 models uh, typically deal with it, we found that the BERT models also needed um, the residual connection to be um, in the same place. Otherwise, the optimization didn't uh, proceed, as you can see on the right in this graph. Um, and we also found that the weights right before residual connections need to be initialized with a much lower variance in order to get um, uh, this to converge. Um, also, you know, when you're dealing with model parallelism, you have to be extra careful about random numbers and um, sort of the state that's involved with uh, generating random numbers. The initialization for uh, neural networks is critical when you're training them. And uh, so we need to keep track of which regions are considered serial regions that share the same random number generator state across many devices and which of them are parallel regions that need to have different random number generator state. Um, and so we, we actually keep track of two sets of states um, and, and need, to, need to pay attention 
uh, to that. And then the uh, sort of final uh, um, uh, detail that I thought was important to bring up is that um, large models are more sensitive to data shuffling. Um, so it turns out that you know these transformer models are so good at, at uh, learning associations in language that they can actually learn associations in the order of the training set that you're using, which is of course not helpful because those uh, associations aren't going to help the model solve any real world problem. And um, it turns out that uh, we need to pay attention to the data loader so that uh, we are shuffling the data uh, more globally in order to avoid showing the model the data in the same order. Otherwise you see um, sort of these training instabilities if you if you look at the um, red curve here. Um, the, the, the large language model being trained with um, sort of an epoch shuffle uh, is, is uh, showing some training instabilities at these epoch boundaries, um, as you, you can see in the loss curve. Now we didn't see those instabilities in the small model, right? So the blue curve up at the top uh, where we're, we're also doing the same shuffling doesn't show that instability, but because the larger model is so much better at learning these associations, um, it, it uh, actually has troubles optimizing uh, if, we, if we use that shuffling. And so um, you have to pay special attention to data loaders uh, in, order, in order to get um, uh, the large models to converge. So um, summarizing, um, you know, natural language understanding and generation is fundamental to conversational AI. In order for us to create the next generation of applications driven by conversational interfaces, we need models that are able to understand uh, questions that people are posing. They need to be able to uh, reason about them. They need to be able to access databases and, um, and facts and in order to come up with answers that are useful to people. And then they need to be able to synthesize results that are conversational and generated you know, according to some sort of personality uh, so that it feels uh, more natural, the interaction uh, becomes more natural. And um, these large language models uh, are really driving enormous advances in all of these areas. Um, we're, we're seeing that uh, large language models are, are able to understand and solve uh, language problems much better. We're seeing also that they're much more powerful in generation, that they start to understand much more deeply about the structure of language and about the objects in the world um, and are able to synthesize results that are, that are much more uh, useful. Um, however, uh, the systems aspect of this work is very important because um, you know, since scale matters so much, we have to pay attention to how to train these models efficiently and we have to pay attention to the infrastructure that's necessary to train these models. Um, and uh, you know, uh, sometimes infrastructure gets a little bit overlooked. Um, uh, the algorithms are very exciting and there's been so much progress in the algorithms, but the infrastructure is fundamental uh, to the advances that these models have been having. Um, and you know, that's been true for a long time now, going back to the original AlexNet, um, which, which uh, was a big advance in image classification thanks to um, better systems and larger models. Now we're seeing that um, really strongly with natural language understanding. And uh, so, so I've spent a lot of the time here in today's talk discussing how we can scale these models efficiently to thousands of GPUs so that we can train the biggest models and get the best results. And we find that as we do that, that um, these models become more and more useful in many different tasks in natural language processing. Thank you.